I'm going to talk to you about like a, a paper that we recently get published, uh, which is about uh, using something called replica mean field limits um, to look at metastable neural network. Uh, so before I get into the details, I just want to make a quick forward, uh, which I usually make. And that is that uh, I guess we can all agree that mathematics is quite successful at explaining uh, those kind of system, the inanimate ones. But when you get to uh, the system we're interested in, which is the brain, uh, um, it's much more arguable uh, to what extent mathematics has been successful. And so my approach, generally speaking, is uh, about using neuroscience to uh, uh, devise new mathematical technique if possible, or uh, to gain biological insight from mathematical analysis. And so I'm not in the business of developing a big, big theory, and that's not going to be the purpose of this talk. Uh, but I'll just try, you know, to to convince you that uh, it's possible to do those two those two things. But I think you guys all agree with that already. So anyway, I said it. Um, so now that I said this, um, what is the inspiration for this talk? So it actually comes from uh, 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 looking a little bit at hippocamp the hippocampus. So we know that the hippocampus, uh, via lesion studies, is involved into memory processing. And actually, we also know that uh, we know very well the circuitry in the hippocampus. And there's a region uh, of hippocampus called CS3 that is characterized by a very high degree of recurrent connection. And so people have come up with some ideas uh, about what this part of the brain may be involved to. And one of the leading hypotheses is that uh, those recurrent network are in the business of forming uh, uh, an energy landscape and this energy landscape is encoding a past experience so memories and so in this picture each memories is sitting at the bottom of the well in an energy landscape and when you try to retrieve uh, a memory basically you are uh, uh, performing some form of random work in this complicated energy landscape and you sensory input is driving you along uh, some trajectories from um, uh, the bottom of a well to another bottom of a well. So that's uh, the typical example of what, uh, what we think of as a, as a metastable uh, trajectory. And those metastable trajectory can be uh, depicted as follows. You spend most of your time uh, around quasi-stationary states, hoovering a little bit, uh, subjected to noise. And uh, by chance, due to your sensory input or some other factor, you will gen suddenly uh, transition to another uh, stationary state. And, and so, okay. So, so it would be possibly of great interest uh, to understand those metastable dynamics uh, insofar as they may encode uh, important process in the brain. So now if you, uh, so that's for the picture and there's a lot of work has been done uh, 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 in this line. And so he started with Upfield, but now if you, uh, if you, if you think about those metastable dynamics, they're not very hard uh, to come about uh, in your model neural network. So this is, a, this is an image of a, a, a publication by the Mazzocuto lab that actually specializes in metastable dynamics. And here what they show is that, okay, so on the left, you have a, a neural network that has uh, basically no structure that's homogeneous and it's a spiking network. And if you let it evolve, it will have a very stereotypical behavior and will relax uh, toward a single stationary state, which asynchronous spiking. Now, if you put structure in the network, and the structure doesn't have to be very complicated, so in this case, uh, you will basically cluster the neurons of your network in three clusters, and in each cluster, there's a strong degree of uh, excitatory recurrence, and uh, across cluster, there's going to be diffuse inhibition. And so just this basic structure is enough for the spontaneous activity to exhibit uh, what we call metastable behavior. So uh, here you can see, see this metastability uh, on the raster plot, uh, because you see, so this is the index of the neuron on the y-axis, and this is a uh, time on the x-axis, and you see that the dynamics is composed of an alternation between a different quasi-stationary state, whereby uh, one or sometimes two cluster will be active and dominate uh, the other one by inhibiting them. Uh, so, so it's not too hard uh, to come up with metastable dynamics. What's much harder is actually if you were given uh, the connectivity structure of the network to predict what would be uh, those stationary states and, or quasi-stationary states, I should say, and even more, more difficult 
would be to predict the residence term into each of those states and the transition rate from one state to another. And so this presumably could be the determinant of, a, of, of some aspect of neural computation. And so that's the, the, the question I was uh, originally interested in when I looked at MESA stability. So, so that's just for the introduction. And so my main question will be uh, that of whether we can predict uh, important time scale or transition rate just from the network structure. Okay. Uh, so I hope that's clear. Um, and so before I get into uh, the approach I took uh, with collaborators to tackle this question, uh, I want to make a, a, a quick point. And that point is that my goal is not to, to simulate, right? Just before I show you a, a slide about simulation. And uh, I, I, will go, I will like to go a little bit beyond this. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, so the first one is uh, uh, the fact that, okay, simulation are costly. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And the more uh, realistic you're going to be, uh, the more costly those, uh, those simulations are going to be in time. The second one is that even so you have uh, an efficient way to perform the simulation, typically what you like to do is explore the phase space, so the dependencies on a finite size structural parameter, such as synaptic connectivity, synaptic weight, population sizes, and so forth. And, and this is typically a gigantic task to, to, uh, uh, to undertake. And, uh, and lastly, uh, even so you can simulate efficiently and perhaps explore uh, uh, the phase portrait, then you will still uh, have the last step, which is uh, to interpret uh, what you've been exploring. And uh, it's typically very hard, right? It's very hard to visualize high dimensional data. And uh, when I say hard, uh, it's because I think that you can argue that perhaps the most efficient way to visualize high dimensional data remains to have some form of algebraic relation between parameters, okay? So, so, okay, so there's a various reason why I'd like to go past simulation, but uh, in a case, just for metastability, the most important one for me uh, will be to try to take into account in some fashion uh, the dependency on finite size structural parameters, because uh, uh, it is known that uh, those transition rates that we are after are uh, very dependent on the finite size of the system, and they actually emerge from the finiteness of the system. So, okay, so uh, these are preliminary remarks. Uh, now, why, why, does, uh, why is it tough to go beyond simulation? So it's because uh, in general, depending on the complexity of your model, but it's a general statement, analytics yeah, is always, almost always impossible. So you have to resort to tricks or to approximation. And uh, uh, before I explain to you the sort of approximation uh, I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm going to try to justify uh, why uh, you should expect analytics to be especially difficult in spiking networks with finite size effect. And so to do that, um, I'm going to uh, consider a simple toy model, which we're going to gradually uh, complexify during the talk. And so uh, this model belongs to a large class of model that were uh, introduced uh, in, the, uh, in the version that I'm using by Galvez and Lokeba in 2013 and which elaborate on uh, uh, stochastic intensity-based uh, models that have been proposed by Bremo and Massoulier. And so this, this simplified toy model is called the counting neuron. And uh, so in that model, okay, I'm considering a finite uh, set of neurons, five in this case, and each of those neurons have a dynamics that characterized by an internal counting variable. And so this counting variable is simply registering the number of spikes that the neuron has received since the last time it itself spiked, okay? And this, this internal variable is gonna guide the neuron toward its net spiking in the sense that the instantaneous rate of the neuron or its stochastic intensity will simply be a linear function of this counting variable. So, okay, so here you have like base rate plus mu CIT where mu is a finite size interaction parameter, okay? So, so you have a finite size model, you just have a few sets of parameters uh, that characterize uh, the dynamic, mu, and the number of neurons, and you'd like to be able to predict uh, uh, the typical state of that network, okay? So, so just to like uh, maybe give a, a, a picture to, uh, to explain the dynamics, uh, here I'm just showing uh, the way uh, neuroscientists would like to, uh, to, to picture what's happening. So, so here you still have your five neurons, 
And I'm just showing an example of trajectory of two isolated uh, neurons from the network. So on top, you have the raster plot of the five neuron, which should characterize the full dynamic of the system. And then on the bottom, you have the individual trajectory of the stochastic intensity of the pair of neurons under consideration. And so in the raster plot, so time axis x, uh, y axis is going to be the index of the neuron, and each dot marks the time at which a neuron spike. So when a neuron outside of the pair spikes, everybody goes up by one unit. When a neuron within the pair spikes, one guy goes up, the other guy reverts to uh, uh, its base level, which is can't uh, reset to zero. Okay. So I hope this makes clear that there is some interaction, and the, and the interactions are mediated by finite size. Finite size jump when I interact, and also finite size jump when I reset. So, uh, so this dynamic is uh, simple in the sense that it's uh, it also it has finite size uh, effect. It remains a, a Markov uh, dynamics, and you can exploit this Markovianity to show that okay, it's it has a stationary state, and you'd like to characterize this stationary state. And so that will amount to basically uh, give a form for the stationary probability of the counting variable in this case, okay? And so that's, that's if, you, if you'd like to uh, explain what's happening in the system, that's the first thing you would like to be able to do. And so exploiting the Markovianity of the system, it turns out that uh, uh, the most natural thing to do is not to directly characterize this probability P, but the closest thing uh, uh, that is to that probability, which is the generating the probability generating function g. So here I'm just showing it, and uh, doing like a classical manipulation of the Markovian operator, you can show that this um, probability generating function would satisfy a PDE, an equation. So if you want to solve this, you'll have to solve a PDE. Okay, I'm not justifying how you derive it. Uh, I can explain it. The only reason why I introduce it is because I want to uh, 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 underline the fact that this is a very difficult task to do. And the reason why this task is difficult is not the PDE uh, aspect per se, like this is linear over here, but it's because of the occurrence of those non-local terms. And they are non-local because they, are, uh, um, they, they require a specific value uh, on the boundary zero and fluxes also. And if you look in the derivation, the occurrence of those non-local terms is entirely due to the finiteness of the interaction. This, there's a term that is due to like the finiteness of the reset and a term, this one, and a term that's due to the finiteness of the interaction. And so anytime you will have finite spiking interaction, you shall expect the emergence of a, a, a non-local term that will prevent you from solving directly problems like this, however simple they are. So, okay, so you can't do that even for, you can't solve for even simple model. Uh, so what can you do if you are in the business of doing analytics? And so uh, the usual approach is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is always the same, is saying like, okay, I can't solve this. So maybe I can solve a variation of this for which I'm not going to be plagued with the problem I identified in the previous slide. And so uh, a, a classical idea is to define some sort of uh, mean field limit. And so an example of such mean field limit is the following. I'm going to just expand my, my network. I'm going to make it bigger. And now in, in this network, I'm going to preserve exchangeability. And I'm going to think of uh, each neuron as listening to a, a, a much larger number of neurons. And so that I preserve the finiteness of the overall drive. If I scale the size of my network by k, I'm going to scale in inverse proportion the strength of the interaction by mu over k. Okay? So in this fashion, I'm going to have some averaging going on. And now the stochastic intensity of each neuron is uh, deterministically varying uh, in response to uh, uh, its upstream input. And the only source of variability will be its own spiking time. And because of this averaging, the neurons will be effectively independent from one another. This independence, this erasure of correlation that were present in the original system, is the main reason why like uh, we expect me feel limit to be solvable okay so so there's been like a lot of work about mean field limit and here i'm going to uh, cite just uh, a, a few references about uh, work that has been done from the computational neuroscience side 
and uh, there's many variation of, of those mean field limits. And I, I apologize in advance if I forget uh, uh, references. I know it's a gigantic, uh, but you know, bulk of work. Uh, uh, and uh, but those work all have, uh, or the vast majority of those work have something in common, is that the type of mean field limit that I analyze have all something in common. Is that they assume some vanishing scaling of the interaction. And this scaling can come in different flavor. It can be one over n, where n is the size of the network. Sorry, I should have put a k here. Uh, just, that's just like the same picture as before. It can be one over square root of n, uh, and that would be uh, the typical limit for something called balanced uh, network. And recently, it's also been suggested that like uh, uh, a, a better limit for conductance-based level would be one over log n. But in any cases, like the effective equation that I, that I looked at, erase completely the finite size uh, uh, of the interaction. And for us, it's going to be a problem because the finite size effect are really, really what sets uh, the time scale of transition in metastable dynamic. Okay, and so, so, so that was this observation was one of the motivation for me and a collaborator, Francois Bacelli, to uh, to develop a, a, a new kind of mean field limit, if you will. Uh, so I'm going to like uh, switch um, in the uh, next slide to explaining uh, what those mean field limits are. But before I want to uh, point out that like the main reference for like a mean field limit uh, is uh, is uh, the Snitmatz uh, uh, book uh, from Saint Floor. Okay. Um, so so now let's go to uh, introduce what we mean by replica mean field limit. And again, the interest is to preserve final size uh, effects. Okay. So this is going to be a similar idea uh, as the uh, original mean field limit. And so this is my original system that I cannot solve exactly. So I'm going to like now consider a system that's closely related to that one, but that hopefully simplify. And as the name indicates, we're going to obtain uh, this model by basically replicating the original model. Okay. So here I'm going to make a four replica network model. So there's going to be four copies of my original model. And at this stage, I've done nothing. So each a perfect copy of the model. And so when neuro, one neuron spike in uh, the model at the bottom here, it does the same thing as here, meaning like the blue guy spikes, when it spikes, it's going to send a spiking impulse to the two other guys, one red guy, one green guy. OK, so at this stage, that is not a replica uh, model for us, because the key aspect of uh, our replica model is that now, when the blue guy is going to spike, he's still going to send an impulse of finite size to a, a red and a green guy, but now he's going to pick that red and green guy uniformly, independently across replica. Okay, so what you need to see is that right, like those uh, those arrows, uh, they like they, they they pick randomly a replica and independently, and so so basically uh, a model implements uh, a randomization of intera of interaction across replica. And, and so you see that it's a very uh, uh, general principle that could be applied to any network that basically interacts in a spiking fashion. And so, so you preserve the finite size of interaction because you, you know, you're still an impulse. So, so that's, that's the main idea. And now the simplifying limit will be that of considering an infinite number of replica, okay? And intuitively, you should expect that considering that limit should lead to a simplification because now that you have an infinite number of replica, the likelihood of two neurons to talk to one another in a finite uh, uh, time, or a finite window of time, is basically uh, vanishing like one over r. So that means that uh, you should expect independence to set in across replica. Okay, so. Um, to justify this point here, uh, I'm not going to like make any uh, theoretical argument. I'm just going to uh, 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 like show you what would be uh, the result of a numerical simulation if I was doing what I should not do. That is actually considering a network of uh, a larger and larger size by increasing the number of replica. So this is a 10 by 10 network, uh, uh, a 10 by 10 sorry, yeah, network. Um, no, a 10 neural network. Sorry, it's the morning. I'm not like super awake. Um, and here I'm showing the correlation matrix, which is 10 by 10, of the neurons within that network. And so if you have the original model, so the replica one model, you see that you have a finite size correlation, negative in this case. 
And now I gradually increase the number of replica in a finite replica model. And what I hope is clear is that uh, the correlation uh, 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 quickly fading away. And that's a strong indication that indeed there is an asymptotic independence settling in uh, across replica. And so this asymptotic independence um, has been hypothesized uh, in a different but related context uh, in uh, uh, the framework of uh, com um, computer networks uh, theory. And in this framework, it's called the Poisson hypothesis. And so the Poisson hypothesis tells you that uh, in the limit of infinite replica, when you interact very rarely uh, across replica, you should basically behave independently because you experience arrival of spikes from other neurons as independent Poisson process. And there's going to be as many independent Poisson process as there are neurons type, where well, type is a color. Okay. And so in those models, the key parameters now become the rate of those arrival Poisson process. And these are the variables that need to be elucidated if we want to characterize replica mean field limit. Okay. And now we expect this Poisson hypothesis to hold true uh, anytime we have a randomization scheme uh, as, as the one I just introduced in the previous slide. So it is possible to show rigorously this asymptotic independence and it's the work of Michel uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Francois. But so far we've only done it for uh, discrete time dynamics and uh, we're about to show it for like continuous time dynamics. So that's why I'm not talking about it too much. So, um, <clears throat> so now, okay, so, so this replica mean field trick is not really model dependent, right? It just requires spiking interaction. <laughs> But now what we'd like to do is actually exploit that trick to compute things, okay? And by computing, I don't mean simulating. I don't want, I'm not in the business in simulating infinite size network. I want to find numerical method that leverage this uh, replica mean field trick so that I can compute those rates and then uh, uh, get characterized um, maybe better my network dynamics. Okay, so that's, that's again, I want to drive this point. And now also I need to add that if the replica mean field trick is somewhat generic, model independent, now uh, solving, finding efficient computational method associated to the replica mean field approach will be model dependent. Like the numerics will be completely model dependent and you have to be very careful. And the reason uh, why it's model dependent is because we will need to solve a finite set of self-consistent equations and it's obviously only gonna be possible for certain subsets of model, okay? So I'm just going to like first start by considering the simplest model so that we see uh, what is the general logic when, when you can solve the self-consistent equation. And then we'll go uh, to a model that is uh, more, uh, more biophysically relevant and that they exhibit a bigger range of behavior. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the original model that you cannot solve. And so what is the replica mean field picture associated to that model? Well, in the replica mean field, things become independent. So I map my coupled network dynamic onto five uh, uncoupled dynamics, and each of them will have a self-consistent flavor. Why? Because now <clears throat> each of the neurons are independent, but is subjected to four independent Poisson process, each with the rate beta. And that rate beta is such that I myself much output some, uh, uh, some spikes with the same rate beta, and that's due to exchangeability. And so that's the origin of the self-consistent nature of the problem. And now if you go back and revisit the original problem, what you've done is you've changed your PDE that was coupling the dynamics of all neurons in five uh, parallel uh, ODE. Now each ODE is parameterized by beta and beta is the unknown I need to elucidate, okay? So now I have an ODE, I need to find a solution which I'm gonna be able to interpret as a generating function and this function is gonna depend on beta. The ultimate goal is find that value beta consistently, okay? So of course, uh, you can, you know, to be able to do that, you will have to consider a model that is simple enough so that it's possible. So in that, in the case of this model, it's gonna be possible, and I'm just gonna quickly show you uh, how it works, because it always works the same way. So, so the first thing to realize is that, okay, it's a simple ODE, so, so we know the, general, the form of the general solution, and in that case, it's going to be parameterized by beta, of course, because beta is the parameter uh, in the equation. And the interesting thing is that it involves uh, a singularity in zero. 
okay, that's a pool. And uh, generally, there will always be too many solutions, and we'll have to sort out those solutions based on the, uh, uh, on the singularity or analyticity. The reason is that we know that the solution we're after should have a probabilistic interpretation, so it should be very well behaved, it should be analytic. And so uh, a usual trick in a DRMF analysis is to actually uh, sort that uh, solution based on the analyticity. So in this case, there will be only one uh, solution that has the proper analyticity, uh, and that's the one I'm showing over there. And so basically, that's a solution that gets rid of the pole behavior in zero. So that solution, this candidate solution, is still dependent on beta. And uh, uh, then I need to do something, an extra step, to characterize beta, that rate that I'm after. And so the only thing you can do, and the most natural thing uh, you should think about, is to say that, OK, uh, my g function is analytic, completely monotone, as I should expect from a generating function. Now it should also be normalized. That means that uh, the value that the function take at one should be one. And so that tells you that that beta should satisfy a, a, uh, you know, an equation that will be the self-consistent equation we're after. And that should be enough to uh, characterize the rate of the Poisson process in the RMF limit. Okay. And uh, actually it is enough and it's, it's actually can be interpreted because if you think about it, uh, I mean, uh, maybe you can't see it, but you can believe me. So there's beta on both sides of the equation, and they play a different role. Uh, beta on this side is going to be the beta of the input, and the beta over there, red, is the beta of the output. Okay, So you can think about it. Uh, the beta in red is this guy. The beta over there is the blue guy. And so the only point I'm trying to make here is that those, those self-consistent equations are nothing but uh, uh, input-output uh, neuron, uh, 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 okay, the other input, output, wait, transfer, transfer function of the neurons, okay? So, so usually when you solve the RMF, what you end up with is the output input transfer function of a neuron when driven by uh, uh, Poisson processes, okay? So, so, okay, so that works for a simple toy model. Now we'd like to uh, uh, develop the same kind of tools for more realistic models, at least, uh, models that are complex enough so that they may exhibit metastable dynamics. And so uh, a class of such model that have been used uh, in, neural in uh, computational neuroscience are the linear, nonlinear cascade models that were introduced by Pilo and Palinsky. And uh, the key part that we're going to focus on for, for us is going to be like uh, the intervention of this nonlinear exponential function in uh, uh, um, the rate function. Okay, so we're going to make we're going to consider a variation of those model for which we can develop uh, the replica mean field analysis. And now I'm going to like uh, describe them a little bit in more detail. So we have a similar model as before, but now. Uh, each neuron is going to be labeled by an internal variable, which will be a real continuous variable. And we're now going to allow the variable to uh, uh, process excitation as before, but also inhibition. And it's going to be very important. And so now you're going to see, you can see that uh, on the little picture that depicts the dynamic of the network, excitation are represented by upward jumps, inhibition by downward jumps. They're still impulse mediated. And we're going to add also a component of relaxation so that there's memory erasure even in the absence of spike. And we're still going to have a reset. Okay, so whenever you're on spike, it goes back to its base level that it has been put arbitrarily to one. So in all the analysis, I'm going to assume that the model is homogeneous, but it could very well be heterogeneous. Okay, so that's why I put heterogeneous, but all my pictures assume that things are going to be, all the equations, sorry, are going to assume that mu are equal. Okay. And so now the key addition to uh, the model is uh, exponential intensities. So why? Because now if we include inhibition, that means uh, our internal variable is allowed to be negative. Ultimately, we want to transform this, this uh, internal variable into a rate, which is always non-negative by definition. So we need to perform a nonlinear transformation. And one of the simplest one and one of uh, the room. Uh, perhaps biologically relevant one, is to use an exponential transformation. So my instantaneous rate is going to be h, where h is some parameter, e to the a x t, okay? And a is another parameter. 
And so, so now, based on the functional form of the model, uh, the natural quantity to consider is no longer the uh, uh, probability generating function, it's going to be the moment generating function, which is the stationary expectation of e to the ux, where u is a variable, okay? So, so if, you, uh, if you perform the replica mean field analysis, you will see that this stationary functional uh, shall um, satisfy some conservation relationship, and you can interpret those conservation relationship in terms of a delay differential equation. So before, in a simplest model, we only had an ODE part that was depending on beta. Now, because of the introduction of nonlinearity, we'll have a non-local non term that's going to pop up that will be of that flavor, u plus a. And, and if you were to uh, interpret this, uh, this, this term, you see that you can think of it as a forward delay term. And so now the goal, if you want to solve the replica mean field limit of those kind of model, you need to find an efficient numerical method that will allow to solve this equation. So that means find beta, and then knowing beta, find L of u, or something close to L of u, okay? So now it's going to be much more difficult. You made the model more complicated, more, more nonlinear. And so you should expect uh, the method to be a, a little bit more involved. And it will be more involved due to the occurrence of, uh, of, uh, of those uh, delay terms. Uh, now, like I put H in red, because H is going to play uh, the key part in resolving this problem, because uh, the form of the equation suggests to interpret h as a perturbative parameter, right? If h is equal to zero, you have a purely ODE problem, so do you, know, you know you're going to be able to solve that via the method I explained uh, before. And so the goal will be to extend or leverage this knowledge of the solution for h equals zero to some finite h via expansion, okay? Um, are people with me so, so, so far? Yeah? Okay, uh, I hope. Okay, so, so the problem is that uh, this kind of perturbation theory is going to be singular because the term that pops up when h is non-zero is a delay term. So it's going to change the nature of the equation. Uh, either we're going to try to do it, and I will, uh, I, I will try to explain to you how it's possible to do it. So, so the first uh, the starting point is to say, okay, for h equals zero, I can use the method I explained before, and I can find the form of the general solution for L of u, my, uh, my uh, uh, moment generating function, and it's going to have uh, like a nice exponential, completely monotone form uh, that I know exactly. So then, uh, when I want to solve it for non-zero h, I can use the resolvent formalism uh, to find the solution under a certain form, which will be a series expansion in h. So if you carry out the calculation, you realize that uh, the right form is not L, actually. It's some function that's closely related to L called H, okay? And that's going to be also a function that's nicely behaved, completely monotone, uh, ex uh, nicely analytic. And basically, the way to uh, uh, get H is to uh, uh, assume that the exact solution for H equals zero is your zero-order solution injected in some integral version of this equation, then get the first order term, and then take this first order term, inject it, get the second order term, and so forth. And then you're going to end up with a series expansion of big H in terms of iterated kernel that involve the perturbative parameter little h. Okay. Uh, the exotic thing maybe is that those uh, iterated kernel are obtained uh, via integrals whose integration uh, frame is shifted by A each time. So this is a little bit uh, non-canonical, but it's actually numerically not a problem. The real problem is that because we're in uh, the framework of perturbation theory, the series that is obtained is usually divergent. I mean, can be divergent. And it's going to be divergent when there's strong excitation, basically. So let's forget about that point uh, uh, up to now and, and, and deal with that series formally. Uh, now we still have a beta dependence that's not explicit. So just as before, we need to add an extra condition uh, to determine beta via an equation. And so in this case, as before, uh, it's going to be a, a condition of normalization. Uh, and th in this framework, the normalization will uh, amount to specify the value of h in minus a. Because then this stuff becomes la minus l0. l0 shall be equal to 1. 
and LA can be expressed simply in terms of beta divided by H. And so if you explicit this equation, now you find a self-consistent relation that determines beta, okay? Now the problem is that um, this series, of course, is divergent. And so it's unclear why you may be able to do anything with this relation, but it so happened that the kind of like uh, uh, singularity uh, that are the origin of the divergence uh, have popped up in many different scenarios in physics, and physicists or mathematical physicists have developed methods to uh, actually uh, um, infer converging series from divergent one that capture the same information. And so we found that using one such method, the method of Padé approximant, allow you to actually compute the value of that series for finite edge over, uh, 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 you know, not a full range of edge value, but a good enough range of edge value for which we can have interesting behavior. And so again, uh, these relationships should be interpreted as an input-output relationship uh, for each neuron. So if it was an heterogeneous network, I would have a different set of equation for each rate, okay? So, so that's for like uh, the math and like kind of like the technique behind it. Now the question is, uh, can you do anything with that? Does it work well? So here I'm showing you a comparison between an exact simulation of different neural network, spiking neural network uh, with exponential intensities and uh, the RMF prediction. It's so fine. I'm looking at a finite size, the original finite size system, and uh, you know there are ways to simulate it exactly via event-driven uh, uh, simulation. And so I'm simulating a long uh, time trajectory of those network, and I'm computing the uh, empirical ra uh, rate of firing of each neuron. So that's the red dot. And then I compare it to uh, uh, the rate that I obtain by solving self-consistently my set of equation uh, in the RMF approximation in black. And so what, what I'm trying to show is that the RMF does a pretty good job at predicting the rate. And so again, I don't have to simulate to get those right. And uh, it's kind of surprising that it does a good job because after all, uh, the RMF limit is not the exact system, right? It's like, uh, it's a system where I've erased every, uh, every dependencies between neurons by, by letting them being driven by independent Poisson process. So, so what it shows you is that for, at least for those neural network, um, pairwise correlation or correlation or dependencies between neurons don't play a big role. And so what, what we found is that it's not surprising in a feed forward dominated uh, a network, but it's kind of more surprising in recurrently connected network. And the reason, I mean, it's just like an observation. It seems that correlation ceases to play a big role once you have a, a mix of uh, inhibitory and excitatory neuron. And it doesn't have to be balanced. And I mean, we, we, we're not sure, too sure why, but anyway. So, so that's great. Um, we have a method to, uh, to at least depict closely what may happen in a real network via RMF. Now the question is, can we use that to study metastability? And actually, can we use those kind of like uh, rate prediction in the RMF framework to predict transition rate in a metastable network. So, um, so don't get too excited because uh, uh, the, if my, my, my answer will be, you know, it's only gonna be a step toward this and I'm only gonna explain it um, uh, on the simplest possible metastable dynamic that is of a bistable uh, network. So I consider here a network architecture that exhibits bistability and has been studied uh, in, in the context of perceptual rivalry in psychology. So, so what is the structure of this network? Well, so there's a, there's a symmetry, right? It's made on two groups on each side, and each side is symmetric, and are made of two uh, uh, population of neuron, an excitatory population that self-excites itself, and then drive an inhibitory uh, population. And now each inhibitory uh, population uh, cross inhibit the other side, okay? And so you should expect a bistability to emerge because when one side is active, it should, you know, shut down the other side. And because this network is finite, there's only a finite number of neurons, 50 in each, uh, actually I think 20 uh, in each pool of cells, 20, 20 neurons, sorry. Um, you should expect noise or internal noise to, by chance, drive switch between a different dominance period of one side or the other. 
And so here I showed uh, uh, the raster plot simulating those neurons. Okay, there was actually 25 neurons in each population. And I recapitulate domination episode by showing the average rate of spiking of each population below. And you see that basically there is alternation between a period when yellow and green dominates and then uh, blue and red. Okay. And so what we'd like to do is say at least uh, be able to uh, approximate or estimate the average residence time or dominance time uh, of one side. Okay. And we'd like to do that using, uh, if possible, uh, the replica mean field network because it preserves some aspect of the finite size uh, of the interaction, which is a key determinant of those rates. So, so if we want to uh, uh, to actually uh, um, implement this program, we have to uh, get an idea about what's happening uh, uh, for the replica mean field limit of metastable uh, network, and so. The fastest way to uh, get a picture of what's happening is to actually uh, perform a simulation. Also, we should never do it. And so here I'm showing a, a simulation in a finite replica version of the model under consideration for one replica, two replica, four replica. And what uh, the point is here is that increasing the size of the system uh, doesn't really change uh, the stationary state uh, that you're switching in between because the, uh, the the rate of firing or the average activity while you're up or down is somewhat the same. But what you change is that it gets uh, the transition rate to become to vanish and to vanish exponentially with the number of replica. Okay, so that means the the residence times grow and grow. And so as a result, uh, if you take the full replica limit, that means when air goes to infinity, R goes to infinity. Sorry you should expect metastable network to become multistable. Multistable in the sense that uh, you're going to have like many stable states, but you're going to stay stuck there. And so that's a similar observation as uh, the one that has been uh, observed for the classical mean field limit uh, of a metastable system by Brasov and others. And, uh, and we should not be surprised because, uh, again, uh, transition rate depend on the finite size of the system. So if I make my system much bigger, well, I'm going to impact my transition rate. And in this case, I'm going to make them vanish. OK, so that's going to be a, a problem. But at least uh, I can hope that I still capture uh, the identity of the quasi stationary state that I'm visiting. So, so here, I'm showing that it's indeed uh, true. So what I'm showing on this graph, uh, hopefully people can see it, right, um, is basically the solution of my self-consistent a set of uh, replica mean field equation uh, while varying a parameter, mu e. Here, mu e is the strength of excitatory connection in the network. So when those connections are very weak, there's little interaction among my different population of neurons, and I should expect the system to only relax toward a low state of activity, so it's monostable. And so I see that, okay, I can uh, predict the rate at which uh, uh, cells are uh, firing in this uh, monostable state, and it accurately match simulation. But then when I'm going to increase uh, the excitatory strength, I'm going to uh, increase the average level of interaction among my cells. And they're going to be a threshold or like a region for which now my monostable system is going to uh, turn into a bistable system because now I'm going to have two sets of solution to my set of equation. And these solutions are predictive uh, uh, of the time, or sorry, the time of the region at which this transition happened in the original system, and also of the value of uh, the rates uh, uh, in those two different states, up and down. So it's not perfect. And also, uh, there's a problem uh, about predicting in the original system when bistability occurs because it's hard to detect it in a finite size system, right? So, so that's the picture, so that's fine. I become multi-stable, but at least I can predict uh, the quasi-stationary state. And that, but at that stage, it would be like the same as the classical mean field limit. What I gain by doing replica mean field limit is that I can predict this, this, those quasi-stationary state via basically mean behavior, but now I also have all the moments. And so, so here I'm just showing, for instance, I can predict also the second moment, 
And it's going to be of interest because in the replica mean field limit, I'm still driven by Poisson process. So I have a sense of viability. I don't become deterministic. I become multistable, but there's still a notion of, a, of, of, of stochasticity that is captured. So what it means is that for my original model, so that's the original trace, within the replica mean field limit, I'm able to predict the up and down state of a neuron in a population, but I'm also able to predict, for instance, the standard deviation, like the viability of uh, 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 the neuron once it's occupied a quasi-stationary state, okay? And that's something that's not accessible in the classical mean field limit. And so that's gonna be like, intuitively like uh, the add-on of, uh, of, of using the kind of tool I've presented and, um, and having this additional feature suggests that now we can use a lens, an effective landscape representation of a dynamic and try to infer those rates via a classical uh, tool uh, from statistical physics, okay? So, so before I explain this, uh, I just need to uh, also allude to the fact that there's two types of transition, right? Presumably, you can transition up to down and down to up if, you are, if your system is completely symmetric. And, uh, and in the next slide, I'm going to argue that you can decide between those two transitions which one is going to be the dominant to, uh, to explain uh, um, the time scale of the switches, okay? So it's going to be heuristic and it's going to be... Uh, uh, based on a correlation analysis of the original system. So here's my original network. And basically, I want to I wanna look at the correlation structure of this network and try to guess which one of the transition is going to be dominated when I go from up to down or down to up. And so here, I'm just showing uh, the correlation structure of uh, my population, right? I have four population. These are there. And this one side is level one. The other side is level two. And uh, what clearly pop up is that, okay, size are negatively correlated. And it's simply due to the fact that if one guy is up, the other one has to go down. Okay, so that's nothing interesting. It's not going to help me. But now I can do my correlation analysis uh, uh, while conditioning on one side being up or down. And now what I see is that essentially, uh, say when side one is up, well, population one is going to be independent from uh, anything else, and it's because they're the driving guy. They're the guy who spikes, and ultimately the source of the spiking is due to their own intrinsic noise or like to some random input they may receive from the background. And so they, to first approximation, they're going to be uncorrelated, but the guys that are silent, they're going to be extremely tightly co correlated among one another because they all average the same input which, and that input is the one from the side that's active and it's gonna be a dominant input, okay? And so what it tells me is that, okay, if I'm switching, it's gonna be a rare event and that rare event has to be driven by transiently high fluctuation that have to emerge at the population level in a population that is highly correlated. And so this suggests that when there's a reversal between dominance, it has to originate from a spontaneous or like from a, from, from a fluctuation that emerge in the down state, right? In the, in the side of the neuron that I inhibited, okay? So that suggests that the dominant uh, uh, time scale is the one that is from down to up, okay? So, okay, so now that we have that, we can make a simple energy landscape based on uh, ability to infer the uh, quasi-stationary state and the fluctuation around those. And in this case, we took a simple model, which is going to be uh, based on a, a simple Gaussian representation. And we're going to approximate the dominant transition time, the one that is going uh, from uh, transitioning down to up uh, via uh, uh, an escape problem. Okay, So basically, we're going to assume that there's a diffusive uh, process in that well and uh, the transition time scale will be determined by the average time it takes for uh, this diffusive uh, uh, trajectory to go over uh, the peak over here. So they are like standard tool. Uh, it's a Kramer's problem, the standard tool in a uh, statistical physics that you can use. And so we've applied those. And uh, what we found is that if you compare the inferred time uh, via replica mean field limit and the predicted uh, and the simulated time via exact simulation, uh, it seems to match very well over almost two order of magnitude. And 
this is a, 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 a switch, sorry, this is a match that is obtained for varying uh, both uh, excitatory and inhibitory uh, connection. And it's also a 10 for a range of, uh, of, of times where you, you know, these are fairly long times, right? It goes up to uh, 10, 10, 50 seconds. So you know that the time scale of the switch is really set by the uh, network property of the, of, uh, of the model, right? Because uh, all the time scale that have been put in the model otherwise of, uh, of the order of milliseconds. Okay, so to have such long time scale emerging, it really has to be a network property. And it seems that you can infer them just based on those simple prediction from the replica mean field limit. Okay, so of course it's not satisfying because we still have to like resort to an effective landscape model. But uh, the hope is that we may be able to go past that in the future by having a more principal uh, approach. So, okay, uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, where, uh, where uh, I'm at at this time. So there's a few uh, natural extensions uh, from this work. So the first one has to do with uh, the theory, meaning uh, uh, can, you, uh, can you establish the Poisson hypothesis under general condition? And can you extend it to uh, even models that are not stochastic in nature, uh, such as like a deterministic one? Then uh, there's like this, this extension I already mentioned, which is having a more principle based uh, approach to extract the, uh, the metastable time scale. And can we do that in more generic network? Uh, and here I assume, uh, I mean, I'd be happy to talk with people who know a little bit about large deviation because uh, I get some idea about uh, uh, how you may be able to do this. And uh, a last extension I'm interested in is looking at when uh, replica mean field limit fail. And this is essentially going to be when dependencies play a, play a role. So we already have ideas about how to deal to some extent with uh, how to include dependencies in the model. But uh, I'll also be uh, interested in uh, make a variation of, uh, uh, of the RMF limit that's based on the compound Poisson process that will incorporate uh, at least positive correlation. Okay. So, so before I conclude with my thank you slide, I want to uh, uh, point out that uh, I am aware that it might be a, a little bit of a lot of math, and some people may argue, why are you doing so much stuff for this? So, so, so just, just why should you care? Well, first is because a lot of like phenomena uh, in the brain have been shown to uh, exhibit metastable dynamics. One of the maybe best known case will be the uh, up and down state switching during anesthesia or sleep. But it has also been hypothesized that uh, um, metastability uh, play an important role in a certain neural computation, especially involving decision making and certain sensory pathways. So let me, uh, decision making, it, it could be like maybe clear, like, like perceptual rivalry and things like that. So sensory pathways, it may be a little bit harder to show, but there's actually an example that's very neat. And so that example has to do with the uh, gustatory cortex. And, uh, and here, uh, I'm showing a picture from a very famous uh, paper in the field by Katz. And what they show is, okay, so, so the gustatory cortex is in the business of uh, encoding different tastes, right? So different piece of chemical information. And so what they show here is that it seems that the gustatory cortex does so via metastable dynamics. So you present different, uh, different compounds and you're gonna realize that basically if you look at cell assemblies, they seem to switch between similar sequence of um, uh, quasi-stationary state, but they do so with different temporal uh, dynamics. And so they suggest that the encoding or the computation that is taking place is based on modulation and transition rate between quasi-stationary state, okay? And so presumably that could be a general mechanism that is used uh, in the brain to perform uh, neural computation. Okay, so uh, I hope, uh, that convince you that it may be interesting to understand the, the link between uh, structure and, and, and transition rate. Uh, the, uh, the work I presented here is uh, uh, about all the, those, uh, this series of paper, but it's mostly based on the, on, on the first one, which was recently published. And, uh, and I think I'm going to conclude and thank you for your attention and thanks my collaborator. So, uh, so just quickly, this work started uh, from a collaboration with Francois Bacelli, who is now in France. Uh, François is uh, uh, now like uh, continue, continues to work on this, with, with, especially with Michel on the theoretical aspect of uh, the Poisson hypothesis. And most of the work I've presented was done uh, with a grad student of mine, Zhao Liu, who, who has now graduated. 
and uh, who uh, basically like bring in all the physics uh, uh, component to it. All right, I guess uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too quick. <laughs>